Good morning. So glad to see you this morning. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, the truth to guide us. Lord, as we open your words, we ask you, Lord, to take away the things that will distract us and help us, Lord, to listen to what you want us to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Okay, a question. Who likes exams or report cards? <laughs> okay, so when I was studying, I had two types of classmates. One type was always, you know, excited to take an exam and to get their report cards. Well, I guess they were the ones who prepared well and they knew they would get great grades, right? But they were the minority. So the majority hated exams, okay? And they were usually really anxious during report card time. They knew they didn't prepare well. It was not good news. So whether we like it or not, we all go through different uh, exams in life, right? Some exams are, ah, it's okay. But some really have important impact uh, for our lives, for our future. And today, the passage that we have just read, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, is the conclusion of Jesus' last sermon in the book of Matthew. And it is all about Jesus giving us our final report card. Okay? So it is called the last judgment, and it will determine where we'll go for eternity. So just to give us a little background, the book of Matthew has been organized in five sermons of Jesus, okay? And all these five sermons talk about the kingdom of God. And the first sermon is the well-known sermon on the Mount. Mount, yes. And you know what? This sermon that uh, during the month of November our pastors have been uh, going through is also a sermon on the Mount. But this one is a sermon on the Mount of the Olives. Yeah, or it's called the Olivet Discourse. And you know what? How did Jesus end the first sermon and this last sermon? He ended with the same tone, with a warning of the final judgment. Okay? So if you remember, Jesus said, not everyone who asked or says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God or heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, this um, warning was followed by the very well-known parable of the wise man and the foolish man, right? And the very difference between them, it was the one did hear Jesus' word and did it. The foolish man, he heard it, but did not do it. So today, in our conclusion of our November uh, sermon series on the king is coming, so we are going to see Jesus also warning, his final warning of the judgment. Now, judgment is a very unpopular topic. I just don't know why it was landed on me, okay. <laughs> but honestly, we don't like to talk about judgment, right? We like to talk about warm, fuzzy stuff, right? And yet we have a love-hate relationship with judgment. Why? So when we read the news, right, all the injustices going on in this world about the powerful nations that are bullying or attacking their neighboring nations, or when we are being mistreated, when people bully us, we feel our blood boiling, right? We want justice. And you know, even little kids, they know what is fair and unfair. When they feel it's unfair, they will get angry. They will cry. They will complain. So deep down in our hearts, we all long for justice. And we want the bad people get what they deserve. Right? We don't want people like 
Putin. To get away with all his atrocities, right? With all his lies. But how about us? Should we get what we deserve? Ooh. So our passage today is not an easy one, first to understand, and really not a welcome passage for a lot of hearts. So it talks about final judgment, being separated from eternity, either eternal life or eternal punishment. And when would this be? It will be when King Jesus comes. So first of all, Jesus says that we will face King Jesus and be separated into two groups. Jesus said in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, who is the Son of Man? Well, we all know, right? From the Gospels, four Gospels, this was Jesus' favorite title for himself. It not only emphasizes his humanity, his humility, but also talks about his divine authority and power. This title actually comes from Daniel's vision of God's judgment. In Daniel 7, 9 to 10, he says, as I looked, as Daniel looked in his vision, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. And his throne was fiery flames, his wheel were burning fire. And a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And then he continued, and I saw in the night vision, and behold, the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom and that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Amazing. And you know what? Uh, Daniel had this vision about 600 before Jesus was born. And Jesus used this language in his teaching, actually in his last sermon, just a little bit before today's passage. So Jesus um, kind of described, he said, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end to the other. So Jesus, the Son of Man, will return as the glorious King, and everyone will see it. Not like the first time, the first Christmas, right? When he came humble as a helpless baby, poor, powerless, laid in a manger. He came humbly because he came to take our place, right, as the substitute sacrifice for our sins, dying on the cross for all humanity. But when King Jesus returns, it will be in all his splendor and glory, the supreme judge of the whole universe with his army of angels to sit in his glorious throne. Now the throne is not just a furniture per se, but it symbolizes his divine authority and power and majesty, which echoes actually John's revelation of the great white throne, if you know what I'm talking about. So what else? Jesus says when he comes before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So, who are the nations? Now, there are different interpretations, but for time, reason of time, I'm just going to give you what I think is the right one. And, okay, it refers to everyone, to everyone, 
from A to Z, from north to south, from east to west, from the greatest to the smallest, including you and I. So no one will escape Jesus' last judgment. Nobody will be exempted. We won't be able to hide and no cover up. Jesus has this powerful x-ray that will reveal everything. And King Jesus will separate the people into two groups. Like the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. Now, what is the meaning of separating sheep and goats? Like today, we don't separate sheep and goats, right? But just a little bit of background. Shepherds, um, in Jesus' time and even today, when you go to Palestine, uh, there are people who are still shepherds. They usually, they have sheep and goats in the same herd, okay? And the sheep and goat, they will go every day to graze and they will mingle and hang around. But they have different characteristics and behavior. So for example, sheep have a thick coat of wool, right? But goats, they have fur and, or hair. So sheep, they need to be separated at least for shearing, okay? Because goats, they don't need shearing. But something even more importantly, sheep's thick wool protects them from the cold at night. But for goats, they need a sheltered place to protect them from the weather every night. So at the end of each day, the shepherd needs to separate them, okay? So sheep, they will be in a small enclosure, but it's open air. Well, the goats, they need to go inside a place and they need more space. They separate because they have different DNAs. They have different nature. They need different things, right? And also because goats, they will fight with sheep if they are too close to one another, okay? So it's interesting. So Jesus used this metaphor, and he used other metaphors too. For example, he would say the good tree and the bad tree, right? Remember the wheat and the weed, yeah. For example, um, the good soil and the bad soil, the rocky, the, the whatever, right? Or Jesus said, oh, the good fish and the bad fish, okay. And today, maybe we need to separate what? Laundry. I don't know. Things that you need to separate, right? It's just some, it's what you need to separate, okay. So, we need to separate white or, or black clothes, I don't know. So what's the point of Jesus' metaphor? The point is that in God's eyes, there are only two types of people in this world. And at the end of the day, they will be separated. The world belongs to God. King Jesus will return to judge. And at the end of the day, Jesus will judge our evil world. He will bring an end to all injustices. And people will have to give an account of their lives to God. As uh, Paul said in Acts 17, 20, uh, 31, he said, because he, God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And we know who this is, right? So in 2 Corinthians, says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, this is really scary, right? If we are just going to be judged by what we do, the Bible clearly says there is no one good, right? Not even one who is righteous. We have all sinned and we fall short of God's glory. So we are all in trouble. But the good news is that God will judge us on another basis. It will be on the basis of how we have related actually to the judge, to Jesus. So we will be judged by how we relate to the Lord now. Okay? So um, we have a, um, a very interesting conversation, Jesus with the sheep and the goat. And if you pay attention, you will notice that what Jesus said to the sheep and to the goats is almost identical. There are only a few words missing. And that makes a big difference. 
the sheep did all these things, but the goat did not. Okay, no, no, did not, did not, did not. Did not minister to me, basically. And, and the Lord mentioned six necessities or six acts of kindness that these people did or did not. Now, hunger, thirst, being a stranger, nakedness or lack of clothing, um, sickness, and in prison. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but a sample of acts of kindness, of compassion. Now, to whom? Very interesting. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers. So we have two big questions. First of all, hey, wait a moment. Is Jesus saying that we will earn our salvation by doing good works? Okay. Why is Jesus saying you did it or you did not? What is Jesus saying? Oh, obviously, the right answer is no. Okay? Otherwise, we will have to throw away all Paul's letters, go into the garbage. It's meaningless. Paul, what did he say? His famous words. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, right? Not a result of works. So why did Jesus say, because you did this and this and this, or you did not do this and this? Okay, so let's see what does Jesus say somewhere else. Now, it's very important that Jesus did not contradict himself. And we will pick examples from Matthew, because this is what Matthew wrote, so we want to find in Matthew's writing, what else did Jesus say? So Jesus said, a little bit earlier, says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to what? To give his life as a ransom for many, right? And later on, in the, at the Lord's Supper, when he instituted this gift, he said, for this is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant, which is poured out for many. For what? Why, why did Jesus have to pour, lose his blood? For the forgiveness of sins, right? And even more precious, when he was praying at Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. And he said, blood, uh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but if it is, if cannot pass unless I drink it, then your will be done, right? Now, what did this cup represent? It was the cup of suffering, right? To take, a, take all the sins of the world and the pain of dying on the cross. So, now, can you see? If salvation is by works, then Jesus didn't have to die. He was, you know, did it use um, unnecessarily. It was meaningless. Now, we have established that actually it should not mean that you are saved by works, okay? Already, Jesus shows to us that it is not. So, Remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount at the end, right? He said that, he said what? He said, a good tree will have good fruit, right? And then he says, you will recognize the tree by their fruit, okay? So salvation is by grace, not by works. But we are saved for good works, okay? The righteous deeds are the evidence of our true new life in Jesus as fruit of the Holy Spirit. So remember the metaphor, right, of the sheep and the goat. So the wool does not make a sheep, right? But a sheep makes the wool. You get it? So the good works, the works of compassion does not make a Christian, right? Or save the Christian. But the Christian makes, produces those good works, right? So it is not enough. So for us, it is not enough just to say, oh, I believe in Jesus, right? We need to show it with genuine 
actions. Jesus is looking for real fruit in each one of our lives. A true born again disciple must show that they somehow have fruit. So this is consistent with what the Bible teaches somewhere else. For example, James 2, 14, 17. Uh, Pastor Aaron mentioned about this verse last week, right? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, oh, go in peace, God bless you, be warm and filled, right? Without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So our good deeds are only evidences of our true faith in God and they are not the cause for acceptance. And this is confirmed by the surprise of the righteous and the unrighteous, right? Remember both groups said, but Lord, when did we see you, right? Oh, maybe Jesus, you put it in the wrong place. Maybe the ship said, oh no, now we're in trouble because I didn't do what he said. Maybe I need to go to the goat side, right? And Jesus said, well, their surprise actually shows that their salvation does not depend on their works, but they are the cause. Because um, that their works are not the cause, but the evidence. Because they were even unaware of the fact that by doing what naturally they wanted to do, would put them in that place, okay? So clearly their kindness was not their way to gain points for heaven. They did it naturally because that was in their DNA, because they are born again and they have the Holy Spirit's DNA in them. Before they were poor, they were hungry spiritually, and Jesus satisfied their hunger. They were enslaved to sin, and Jesus set them free. They were sick with destructive behavior, and Jesus healed them. And they have experienced God's grace and favor and mercy. And that's why the sheep are those who just are so transformed by Jesus and his teachings that they live out his mission naturally, selflessly, and unconsciously. So now we tackle the other question. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, again, there are different interpretations, but I'm going to just give you what I think is the right one, and a lot of commentators, um, I agree with those commentators, okay? So, remember when Jesus, one day he was preaching, he was so busy that he didn't have time to eat, and then... His mom and brothers took the things into their own hands and went trying to look for Jesus, right? And then what happened? They said, Jesus, your mom and brothers are here. And Jesus replied. He stretched out his hands towards his disciples. And he said, here are my bro mother and my brothers. Now, the word brothers applies to brothers and sisters, okay? And then Jesus explains, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, this is the only way Jesus identifies who his brothers are. And furthermore, if you remember in Acts chapter 9, when Paul was with all his fury trying to kill or, or imprison believers before he was converted, right? On the road to Emmaus, and Jesus shone a light on him, intercepted him, and then Jesus said, so, so, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, we know um, from all the records that Paul never met Jesus personally, okay? Paul was persecuting people of the way, those disciples of Jesus. But can you see? Jesus identifies himself with his disciples. It's not just we identifying ourselves with Jesus, but actually he identifies himself with us. And furthermore, as brothers and sisters, 
we are united in Jesus and that bond, spiritual bond, is even stronger than any other bond on earth because that would transcend this life. And so um, all believers of Jesus, in that sense, will have to suffer a little bit like Jesus. This is a given. Jesus says that in this world, what? You will have trouble, right? But um, take heart, I have overcome the world. So Paul says then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. That means the family of God. Why? Because we will be ostracized. If you are going to be a good witness of Jesus, if you are going to be intentional, one way or another, I assure you, you will have some kind of persecution. That's why Jesus, when he was leaving the disciples, he said, don't be troubled, right? And then he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people, all the nations will know that you are my disciples. If you, what? If you love one another. And this is how we are supposed to wait and prepare for Jesus. Remember the previous sermons? There are three therefores, okay? Therefore, it says, stay awake. Second, therefore, be ready. Therefore, watch. How? Be faithful and be wise, okay? How are we to be faithful and wise? Serving God faithfully, right? And serving his people and sharing the gospel. Now, maybe in today's term, Jesus will tell the sheep. He say, remember the time when a brother in your fellowship, they lost a job, their job. He didn't have money to put food in the, uh, for the family. And you went and bought groceries and visited him. Or remember the time when a sister was going through difficulties at home. She needed a place to stay for a week or so, and you open your house for her. Or remember that family with three kids, their mom was fighting cancer, and you cooked meal for them. You took the kids even to McDonald's. You drove them around. Or remember the offering that you collected for the, um, those in the war in Ukraine, a relief effort that the churches in Poland are sending uh, food and also um, pastor with the gospel to those who are in danger. Or remember, you sat with that kid, new kid in your school. He was all alone in the cafeteria and you went and sat and introduced yourself. The list can go on and on. And maybe you say, Jesus, is that right? But I thought that was the most natural thing to do. I didn't know it, I was doing it for you. Yeah, that's right. It's because it, it should be in our DNA. And D.A. Carson uh, explained this uh, very interestingly. So he says, good deeds done for Jesus followers, even the least of them, are not only works of compassion and morality, but reflect where people stand in relationship to the kingdom and to Jesus. Isn't that right? We do that because it shows where we stand in relationship to Jesus and to his work, his kingdom. So Jesus identifies himself with the fate of his followers and makes compassion for them equal to compassion for himself. Wow. So therefore, if we're judged only for our works, we'll all fail, right? But actually we are going to be judged based on how we respond and relate to Jesus, to his message and to his messengers today. So last one, thirdly, we will be destined to eternal life or eternal punishment when Jesus returns. Now this is a hard point. So the sheep and the goat's destiny will be completely the opposite, right? Night and day, black and white. The goats, to the goats, the king will say, depart from me, 
This is a command to go away. Have you ever been rejected? Go away, all right? It's an echo of Matthew chapter 7, 23. Depart from me, you evildoers, Jesus said to a group of people. Now they are cursed because they have rejected God, right? Jesus said, depart from me, you cursed. Why? Because they rejected God's blessings. And where else can you find blessing with, without God, without peace, without love, grace, and the truth? So they will go to eternal fire, which was intended for the devil and his angels, those who have actively rejected God. Now, Matthew uses fire frequently as a worst possible description of hell. Hell is not God's intention for people. However, people choose, choose to go there when they follow the ways of the devil and his angels rather than God's ways. Now just imagine for a moment, okay? How terrible would it be to end up with the devil and his angels? Maybe end up with a bunch of people who are like Putin, okay? The deceiver whose only intention is to evil and to destruction. It would be worse than losing your passport when you're on vacation, okay? Or missing the plane or missing the cruise and being left in the middle of nowhere. It would be worse than pressing the wrong button and delete your 12-page assignments due next day. It would be worse than people stole your cell phone or you get grounded for a week with no video games, or getting fired. Well, actually, these are silly comparisons. There is no comparison with even the worst of our worst nightmare to what it will be without God. And there won't be any more second chances. No more grace, no more hope. Sometimes we we sing about amazing grace, right? Grace is so beautiful, it's so great, and it is wonderful. But you know what? The invitation of grace will not be forever. It will end one day. Now, in contrast, let's see what the king says to the ship. He says, come, totally the opposite, right? Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Imagine King Jesus inviting you to his home. Come. What a wonderful honor. They are blessed because God's favor and grace came to them. And they have been righteous, made righteous because Jesus' sacrifice was on their behalf. Now, an inheritance is a free gift, okay? Um, and you get it because of your status, your identity. Your identity is a son of God, so you inherit from the Father. From the foundation of the world means that it has been God's plan and intention all along to have you with him in fellowship, just like Adam and Eve at the beginning before the fall. So can you see how different the sheep and the goat will end up? Now the question is, am I a sheep or a goat? Do you know your identity? Because your destiny will totally depend on it, either heaven or hell. There is no third option, no middle ground, okay? When Jesus returns, there will be no more grace. So why wait, right? Listen to King Jesus' invitation. Actually, do you know what? This is actually his invitation for all of us today. Jesus tells all of us to the whole, all the nations, come, be blessed, inherit the kingdom, receive God's kingdom, right? Be blessed, be justified. I died for you. Now, can we hear Jesus' invitation today? Yes, this is for us. This is the gospel. But... If we receive this invitation today, we will hear it when he returns. Now, yesterday, um, I was in a retreat with our 
EM steering committee members. And during lunch, we were talking about, you know, uh, many things, and the topic of Taylor Swift era came up. So they were saying, you know, some of them said, I heard that there's, there's some people who are reselling the tickets. You know what's the maximum price? 9,000. Some people are willing to pay 9,000 for three and a half hours, okay? Wow, this is a diehard Swifty, right? But I also heard that there were some Swifties who couldn't get the tickets. But anyways, they just went downtown and they tried to hang around in the Royal Center just maybe to feel the vibe, I don't know, okay? So imagine, just imagine what would happen if all these people were trying to breathe in, you know, Taylor Swift vibe or whatnot, all of a sudden, Taylor Swift shows up, comes up, and she says, hey, come, you who are blessed by me. I have free tickets, take it, and prepare for you from the beginning of the tour. Wow, what would you do? You would explode, right? It would go viral. You would live the rest of your life to tell everybody you got free tickets, three and a half hours. But imagine, Jesus is inviting us free into his eternal concert. What are we waiting for? Now, Jesus is not scaring us from hell, because that's his grace for people who don't want to be with him. Just be there and with a whole bunch of people who don't want to be with him. But he came to lure us to his grace, to his love, to his forgiveness. So I would like to give all of us an opportunity to, to think and pray. Maybe today is your day to make a decision, to tell Jesus, that you want to be his sheep. But you know what? To be a real sheep, you really need to know that you are poor, that you are hungry and thirsty. You need to want it. You need to know that you are sick from your sins. You need to know that you are imprisoned with all your bad habits. And there is no other way around, but you need Jesus. Unless you understand your spiritual condition, you will, might be a tree without fruit. Okay, so let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you, we thank you. We cannot imagine how glorious you are, how great you are. But thank you for coming to this world to be like us and to die on the cross for us. Lord, thank you for your invitation to come. And God, I pray for all of us here. If there is anyone who is struggling to say yes to you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work in their hearts and give them the courage and the thirst and the hunger for you. And Lord, for us who we know we are your sheep, but Lord, we, we are struggling with issues too. Lord, please, we ask your renewal and the fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit so that we can really flourish to be the sheep that is pleasing to you, that bears fruit in season and out of season. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you.